All right, so for the last talk of the day, uh, we're gonna have Patrick Wardle talk about... <laughs> no, welcome to my talk. We're gonna be talking about uh, documents of dooms, looking at various macro-based attacks on macOS. I'm gonna skip this slide, I assume by now. Hopefully you know who I am. If not, we should chat. So today we're gonna be talking about uh, malicious office documents. So first we're gonna start by looking at uh, recent, recent attacks targeting macOS users. Uh, attacks that leverage or utilize macro lace documents. Uh, we're then going to talk about how to analyze these documents, uh, specifically how to extract the macro code from them, analyze those macros, and then also look at the payloads. Finally, uh, we'll see these current attacks are rather lame, so we'll end by talking about a new attack and an exploit chain that combines a few zero days that allows us to break out of uh, Microsoft's sandbox and persistently infect macOS, bypassing some of Apple's latest security mechanisms as well. So let's dive in. Uh, start by looking at some recent macro-based attacks targeting macOS. So first, just to make sure we're on the same page, what is a macro? I've added the official definition from Microsoft, but in short, you can think of macro as embedded code in an Office document. And this is normally written in VBA. So it allows us to add code to documents. Made a little example, we have some VB script. We can see we, we embed that into an Office document. When the document is opened and the user clicks allow, there'll be a little pop-up saying, hello world. Now from a security point of view, I'm sure you can all imagine this is a horrible idea. Uh, so, you know, even back in the day in 1999, the infamous uh, Melissa virus, which caused a large amount of, of damage, especially for the context of the late 90s, was, you guessed it, a macro-based virus. Now, Microsoft has added some mitigations. For example, now there's alerts that the users have to click through to enable macros. And also now Office uh, is sandboxed, but as we'll see, this really hasn't stopped attackers too much and really hasn't mitigated the threat, uh, at least fully. Now, traditionally, these macro-based attacks have targeted Microsoft Windows systems. So if you talk to someone about a macro-based attack, they'll probably think, oh yeah, this is just you know, Microsoft on, on Windows. And this is for two reasons. Uh, first and foremost, these macros are a Microsoft creation, and thus they only work on uh, Microsoft products. So for example, if you open a macro document in Apple's Office Suite, uh, for example, in um, you know, Notes or Pages, it's not gonna work. The other thing is, uh, traditionally, uh, Windows computers have just been more prevalent. However, as we've talked or heard some other talks uh, in, this, in this conference have mentioned, Macs are becoming a lot more prevalent, especially in the enterprise. And a lot of these Macs in the enterprise uses Microsoft Office. So they have Office on Macs. So hackers have you know, fairly obviously seen this as a new attack vector, new targets. And so I've started to develop macro-based attacks targeting specifically Mac OS. So now let's look at some recent attacks, uh, attacks that leveraged uh, macro-laced documents. We're going to look at, in this section, uh, kind of a high level of just some of the attacks. And then in the next section, we'll dive into the specifics of these attacks, how to pull out the macros and look at their payload. So starting in 2017, uh, we have a document that appears to be about Trump's uh, unfortunate election victory. Uh, it's really actually not about this, but if the user was tricked into open it and, and again clicked on enabled macros, it would infect uh, their system. And again, this was one of the first instances of uh, a macro attack, but specifically targeting Mac users. So uh, Microsoft Office on Mac OS. Moving on to 2018, we have another document. Uh, it's about Bitcoin. At the time, it was a very trendy topic. Uh, it was sent to you know, users or those who potentially would be interested in Bitcoin to kind of get them to open that. Uh, again, if they open the document, they would be infected. Now, we'll dig into this more shortly, but probably the most interesting part about this attack is it actually contained a sandbox escape, which allowed the macro code to execute uh, outside the sandbox and allow the attackers to do more damage to the system. On to 2019, we have a office document from the very prolific Lazarus group. Uh, Lazarus group are the North Koreans, very persistent uh, APT group. Uh, and so the takeaway from this is it's kind of interesting to see even somewhat sophisticated APT groups jump on the, hey, let's target macOS users via macros uh, bandwagon. Uh, 
Again, if the user opens the document, they have to click enable macros. But if they do, they will the system will be infected and the remote attackers will have access to the box. That's kind of an overview of some recent attacks. Let's now dive into how we go about analyzing these documents. For example, how we can extract the embedded macros and analyze then both that macro code and any embedded payload. So first, obviously, once we have a malicious document, we need to figure out how to extract the macro code so that we can analyze it. Now, we don't have time to go into the file format of Microsoft Office and how macros are installed or rather uh, integrated, embedded in the documents. But really, you don't have to worry about that unless you really want to nerd out on that stuff. Because the good news is there's a lot of tools out there that if you basically give the tool uh, a document that contains embedded macros, it will extract those mac macros for you. So my favorite is the OLE tool suite that's available on GitHub, open source. Uh, if you download it, uh, specifically one of the tools is OLE VBA. If you execute that with the dash C flag and pass the path to uh, the document, which has the embedded macros, it'll parse the document and dump all the macros to standard out. So here, for example, we did it on the kind of proof of concept hello world file I created at the beginning. We can see, yes, indeed, there is the recreation or actually the macro code that's been uh, extracted from the document. There's also some online uh, websites where you can take a document, if you think it uh, has macros in it, upload it, and it will extract the macros. I like to do it locally because you know, we don't always want to be sharing these documents in the web. So now we understand how to extract the macro code. So let's return to the documents, the attacks we just talked about, and look at what some of these malicious macros do. So we'll start with the document from 2018. Uh, if we run that OLE VBA script, uh, passing the path to the document, we can see I'll parse the document and extract the macros. First thing I want to point out is the auto open function. Now, this is a Microsoft API. And according to the API specifications, it'll automatically execute whatever you specify there, again, assuming the user has clicked enabled macros. So here we can see there is simply a call to a method or function called Fisher. If we go down a little further in the code, we can see the implementation or the macro code, that Fisher method, and what it does. You can see simply it concatenates a base64 encoded string, and then it's going to decode and execute this via Python. So we can manually decode this string. I usually just hop into a Python interpreter, use the base64 decode module, pass the string, and we can see that it decodes to some Python code, which makes sense because, again, they execute this via Python does four things. It first checks if Little Snitch is running. Little Snitch is a very popular firewall product for Mac OS. It then downloads a second stage payload from securitychecking.org. It decrypts this payload and then executes the decrypted payload. Now, if you do enough analysis uh, on Python backdoors and macro code, you know, this code will start to look familiar, especially that check of Little Snitch. So as soon as you see that, it's like, hey, I've seen this before. And what it is, is it turns out to be part of Empire. Empire is a very popular open source backdoor for Mac OS. So all the attackers did is they basically took Python, this Python backdoor Empire, and encoded it into their macro code. Now, unfortunately, securitychecking.org, this is the attacker's command control server, was offline at the time I did this analysis. So we're not sure what that second stage payload was but it's likely to just be a second stage empire payload. Again, since the attackers are already using this backdoor, it makes sense that you use other components as well. We move on to that Bitcoin document from 2018. Again, using OLE VBA, we can dump the embedded macros. Somewhat similar, this code is executed, again, automatically if the user clicks allow, by another API, Microsoft API. Instead of the auto open, this one uses the document open, which is conceptually exactly the same. User opens the document, whatever code is specified in that method will be automatically executed by Word. Again, it, it contains some encoded Python, and then this embedded property list, which is a little unusual, a little strange. If we do decode the Python, Base64 encoded, so very easy to decode. We can see it connects out to a server at 192.202.107.20. And all it does is it then expects a second stage payload, which turned out to be Metasploit's Meterpreter. So this command and control server, this IP address, was still active at the time of analysis. So I could go grab that second stage payload, 
And again, it turned out to be uh, Metasploit's uh, payload. And you know, this is nothing fancy, but it does give the attackers access to the remote system, allows them to run other files, commands, processes, et cetera, et cetera. Now I mentioned kind of an interesting piece of this attack was that embedded property list and also the fact that it contained sandbox escape. So recent versions of Mac OS, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, if Microsoft Office is running, it's running in a sandbox. And what a sandbox is, is basically something that constricts or constrains the activity of whatever is running inside. So even if the user clicks allow, for example, and allows a malicious macros to execute, these macros are going to be limited about what they can do. So for example, they're not going to be able to persistently install a backdoor, uh, access the user's keychain, et cetera, et cetera. A while ago, though, a researcher, security researcher named Adam Chester was analyzing Microsoft Office Sandbox. And he noticed in the Sandbox there was an exception that basically said, even though Office was sandboxed, it could write to anywhere on the file system as long as that file ended in tilde dollar sign, the file name. So what he figured out was that he could create a launch agent that on the next login would be automatically executed by Mac OS. And since it was executed by Mac OS, instead of code within the sandbox, it would be executing outside the context of the sandbox. In other words, it was a sandbox escape. So what the attackers did, uh, Adam posted a guest blog on Objective-C as they likely read this blog. And then they stole, or rather copied his code verbatim into their macro, into their malicious document. Now, this kind of makes sense because again, they're likely wanting to escape out of the constraints of the sandbox and attackers are usually lazy. So if someone's already created a sandbox escape, why not just copy it? So that's exactly what the attackers did in this case. Finally, let's look at the last document, uh, Lazarus Group's APT document. Again, using the OLE VBA tool, we extract the code and it turns out the macro code, which is executed by the auto open API, is very straightforward. It simply connects out to a command control server via curl and then downloads and executes a second stage payload. The second stage payload was one of Lazarus Group's uh, persistent backdoors, which would then give them more persistent access to the, uh, to the system. But again, since this was sandboxed, at least on recent versions of Office and Mac OS, it's likely that that perhaps would fail. So that's kind of an overview of recent macro-based attacks uh, against Mac users specifically. And it kind of gives us an understanding of the status quo. Now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about a new zero-click macro-based exploit chain. And we might be asking why we want to do this. And in my opinion, it's simply just because current macro-based attacks are incredibly lame. And let's list the ways. So first, all of them require the user click enable macros. So anytime the user gets one of these uh, documents that contain embedded macro code, Office will pop up this huge warning that basically says, you know, this document contains this macro code, you really probably shouldn't open it unless you, know, you really know where it's from. Now, some users will still click allow, as we all know, that's why we have great job security. But there are the majority that hopefully will be like, yeah, I probably shouldn't click this, especially if it's some, some random email address. So that to me is kind of a showstopper, at least from a more sophisticated attack. Also, Microsoft has now patched uh, Adam's sandbox bug, which means that all these macro-based attacks are going to be, again, executing in the context of the sandbox, which really means they can't do much damage to the system. And then finally on Catalina, and kudos to Apple for this, uh, Catalina introduces kind of this idea of notarization, which means any file that comes in in a document or is downloaded from the web has to be notarized. So even if the attackers find a new way to execute macros, perhaps even break out of the sandbox, they then try to execute a second stage payload. Mac OS will block that because obviously that's not going to be notarized by Apple. So in a way, these current attacks, it's really game over, blocked. So that was really the inspiration because anytime a company such as Microsoft patches something or Apple introduces some security mechanisms, I don't know if this is an issue, but I really want to bring them. Like this gets me like excited. So I really wanted to poke on this and say, you know, could the attackers do a better job here? And are or is Microsoft's patch and Apple's new security mechanisms really kind of uh, as valuable as their marketing departments would like us to believe? So let's walk through this exploit chain. 
So the exploit chain starts with a very neat bug. It was not found by me. It was found by two other security researchers in conjunction with CERT. And what they found is that even if macros are turned off, they could create a document that contained macros that would be automatically executed when the user opened the document. There would be no alerts, no prompts. It's pretty neat. So how did they do this? Well, turns out they abused an incredibly old file format called SYLK. And this file format is literally from the 1980s. So in terms of computer technologies, that's ancient. I mean, that was before I was even born and I'm pretty old. So this is like a really old file format. They also found that if they used this old file format and they wrote macros in a precursor language that predated VB, it's called XLM, not XML, XLM. They found that Microsoft would still support this file format because Microsoft is all about compatibility. And they found if they created a document using this ancient file format and wrote the macro code in this really old school macro language, uh, even if macros were set to be fully blocked in the system security settings in Office, they would be automatically and silently executed. So I wrote a simple proof of concept based on their codes. Again, credit to them for finding this bug. What we're gonna see is we're gonna see me downloading an Office document from the web, opening in this, and then we're gonna see the document spawning calc.app. Again, with no prompts. So the first thing I do, I go to this website, this SLK file is downloaded, double click it, it's open in Excel, there's macro code in that, and calculator is automatically executed. So this is a great first step. We have the ability now to execute code with no alerts, no warnings. So far, so good. However, we've noticed and stressed several times that uh, on recent versions of Mac OS and on more recent versions of Microsoft Office, Office itself is going to be sandbox. So sure, we can spawn calculator, but if we look on the slide, we can see that spawning calc is actually sandboxed. And as I mentioned, if you're sandbox, you really can't do anything. Like you can spawn calc and that's cool, but that's not as cool as it used to be, right? Back in the day, you spawn calc, game over, right? Now though, you need to break out of the sandbox because if you're an attacker, you wanna do things like install a keylogger, uh, install a persistent backdoor, uh, dump the keychain, right? All those kind of more problematic activities, you can't do that while you're in the sandbox. And that's exactly why sandboxes were designed. So in short, we need to find a new sandbox escape to do any real damage. So I started looking at Microsoft's patch for Adam's bug, and it turns out they didn't actually fix or address the faulty regex. They simply created another kind of exception to the exception that basically said, sure, you can still create files anywhere on the file system as long as they start with tilde dollar sign, but you can't write to the application script directory or the launch agent directory. So they basically shut down his attack vector without actually addressing the bug. And a lot of times we see these large companies patching these bugs in this manner. And yes, it kind of stops that one attack, but usually doesn't address the more systemic or underlying issue. So our goal, of course, is to be able to execute a binary, a random binary, outside the context of the sandbox. So we can persist, so we can do evil things. So we just noted that even on the most recent version of Microsoft Office, we can still create these files anywhere on the file system, as long as they start with tilde dollar sign, except for the launch agent directory. Turns out we can also do some other neat things via the sandbox. For example, we can see that we can both download and execute code. Uh, so fired up a process monitor using that XLM macro languages, uh, wrote the instructions to go out to a web server and pull something down via curl. And then because it was named tilde dollar sign, I could write it anywhere. I just wrote it to the temp directory. And then somewhat surprisingly, I was able to spawn that. Now, it's really important to note that though we can talk to the network and download and execute scripts, those will still be sandboxed. Because on macOS, anytime you spawn a child process, if the parent process is sandboxed, the child will be sandboxed as well which makes sense, right? This is a really smart design decision, but it's still a start. So what we can do, I found via a Python script, again, name it till the dollar sign and put it anywhere we want, we can create a login item. Now a login item is automatically started the next time the user logs in. And since it started by Mac OS, not directly via, uh, by us via the sandbox, this means it's not going to be sandbox. So, in a way, we've now just found a sandbox escape. And we can confirm this by persisting 
again, via our Python script, which is sandbox. Uh, we can persist terminal.app. And if we log out and then log back in, on the bottom of the slide, we can see if we look at the sandbox uh, column in Activity Monitor, we can see that instance of terminal that we persisted is not sandbox. Uh, and a shout out to Jaren who talked about true tree earlier. We can now nicely see a process list confirming that, yes, again, terminal.app was executed automatically by the login window when the user re-logged in. And again, this is why we are now outside the context of the sandbox. However, we run right into Catalina's new security requirements, uh, specifically the quarantine and notarization issues. So yes, we can persist, say, an arbitrary binary as a login item. And yes, it will, in theory, be executed outside the context of the sandbox. But before it's run, Mac OS on Catalina will check. And since this binary is likely downloaded by us via our malicious macro code, it's going to have a quarantine attribute set, which means the system is going to check if it has been notarized by Apple. And since it obviously won't be, it will be re resoundingly blocked, and this will be logged to the system. But hope is not lost uh, if, and this is still a big if, if we can create a launch agent, we can specify arguments in the property list file we create. And what we can do is we can create a interactive remote shell that leverages bash. And since bash is an Apple process, Apple binary that's already on the system, there won't be any quarantine checks that's implemented. So this would then allow Bash to connect out to our command and control server outside the context of the sandbox, which would allow us to download and execute files that would not be uh, quarantined and thus not uh, be validated for having been notarized. But recall, Microsoft's patch specifically prevents us from creating launch agents. So we have these two potential pieces, but we can't really put them together. So this is frustrating. Like I munged on this for a good day because it really annoyed me. So we can escape the sandbox, right? That's cool uh, via login items. But login items cannot take arguments. You can't pass anything to the item you're persisting. They also can't be random binaries because, again, when they are about to be launched, macOS will be like, GTFO, this is not quarantine. So sure, we can persist calculator or we can persist terminal that will be executed. But again, since we can't pass any command line arguments, this is essentially useless. And sure, as we showed, we can also bypass or get around sidestep Apple's quarantine and notarization requirements using a launch agent. But again, we can't create a launch agent because Microsoft has specifically patched that attack. So in other words, what we need to do is we need to find a way for the system or an Apple binary, again, with no arguments, to create a launch agent for us. So I kind of had this random idea, and this was kind of an epiphany, and I'm very proud of this, but I said, what happens if I persist? It's weird that I get proud of these things, but you know, <laughs> maybe I need a new hobby. But anyways, I said, what happens if I persist a zip file? Like, can, can you even do that? And so, okay, let's, let's give this a try, you know, what does this do? And it turns out if you persist a, you know, a zip file or some other file on login, macOS will automatically invoke the file handle, handler to process that type of file. So this means if we persist a zip file, uh, when the user logs in again, Apple will execute the archive utility to unzip our file. Now, remember, we want to create a launch agent, but due to Office's uh, custom sandbox rule, we can't actually write any files to the launch agent directory. But if that doesn't exist, which it doesn't on default installs of Mac OS, what we can do is we can place a zip file one directory up from the launch agent directory, specifically in tilde slash library. We persist then that zip file. Then when the user logs in, Mac OS will be like, well, you persisted a zip file. I know exactly what to do. You probably want to unzip that file. If we create that zip file in a special format that it has the launch agent directory and then a launch agent plist for us, the archive directory will create that launch agent for us. And again, this all works because even though Microsoft Office has this rule to block creating the uh, launch agents, we are now outside the sandbox and archive utility is doing the one for us. So here's the entire exploit chain. The user opens one of these old school SLK files. Uh, this contains these XLM macro code, which again, it's automatically executed with no alerts. What this does is this downloads and persists this specially crafted zip file. 
And then the next time the user logs in, archive utility, which is a signed Apple binary, doesn't have to be notarized or anything, will execute outside the context of the sandbox, so we're running as a login item. It will kindly unzip the zip archive for us and will create the launch agent for us. Now we have to wait one more time until the user logs out and logs in again, but since now we've created a launch agent, this again is also started automatically by macOS, which will then execute our bash base backdoor. So again, here's our bash base backdoor. It is now persistently installed as a launch agent. When the user logs in the second time, it'll be automatically started by macOS. It's running outside the context of the sandbox. Awesome. And it's also then allows us to download and unquarantine files. So this is great. This is basically game over. So what did, I, what did I decide to persist now that I have Sandbox Escape? I thought it'd be really neat and kind of the ultimate uh, confirmation of this technique to persist an unsigned piece of repurposed malware. And as you can see in the Slack logs, and again, I want to give a shout out to Jaren because he kind of like helped me through this whole process. I was trying a bunch of things and kept failing. Uh, so obviously, when I got to the end and I got this all to work, I was I was really stoked. And, and so thank you for Jared for you know uh, hanging out with his like emotional roller coaster. <laughs> so let's wrap this up. So first, uh, as the uh, responsible security researcher that I generally am, uh, I, reported these, <laughs> I reported these bugs to both uh, Apple and Microsoft last year. Microsoft was kind of like. Yeah, this is valid, but this is a known issue on the Apple side. And I was like, yeah, because I also reported this to Apple. So as far as I know, Microsoft didn't do anything. Uh, Apple on the other side uh, acknowledged my submission, uh, and then I didn't really hear a lot from them. I followed up with them last week, and they said, ah, we fixed this in 10.15.3. So kudos to them. Uh, you know, it'd be nice if there was a little more back and forth communication. But at the end of the day, the good news is they have, I believe, comprehensively fixed this. Uh, so. Kudos to Apple for you know kind of taking this a little more seriously than perhaps uh, Microsoft. Now, I briefly want to mention detection for these and other type exploits because it turns out if you're looking for the right things, which you should be, it's actually pretty easy to detect this, even though we're leveraging a series of zero days. So the first thing is if you're monitoring processes and if you're creating an endpoint security product, you should be monitoring processes. We can see that Microsoft Excel has spawned both Perl and Python. Like, that's a big red flag. Like, I, I'm not aware of any legitimate scenarios where, like, Word should be spawning Python. And if it is, you should be able to probably understand or look and figure out if it is legitimate. But again, look for this. This is not legitimate behavior. And then second, if you're monitoring for persistence, which, again, is something you, I think you should be doing because the majority of malware and a lot of exploits will have some persistent component, you would see a zip file being persisted as a login item. So first, anytime a login item is persisted, take a look at that because that might be just a normal piece of malware persisting. But if you see something that's not an application being persisted, like that's a big red flag. All right, so that is a wrap. Uh, we kind of showed today the current state of affairs in macro world. We saw that attackers, yes, they are now kind of focusing more and more on Mac OS as Macs become more prevalent in the enterprise. Uh, luckily though, current macro based attacks are pretty lame. However, we showed if we poked around and kind of abused some features of Mac OS that we were pretty easily able to find a zero click exploit that could be delivered to users and allow us to remotely infect uh, Mac OS users, even at the time on fully patched uh, Mac OS systems running the latest version of Microsoft Office. And yes, again, kudos to Apple for the new quarantine and notarization enhancements. Those are good. But I always like to say that Apple security enhancements are not a panacea, right? So they're a step in the right direction and they make it definitely harder to exploit. Uh, but you know, we should always, I think, be still monitoring the system for suspicious activities because attackers will always be able to find ways around that. So that's a wrap. Uh, mahalo for attending my talk. Uh, we have a few minutes if there's uh, any questions about macros, bypasses, or anything else. Yes? Are you more frustrated with the last case or the 
<laughs> so the question was, you know, I, I have a problem and I've talked about this with some friends, you know, when, when I get stuck at something at work, it's just, you know, it's like, yeah, go home and leave work. And it's like, no, it's just kind of on my mind. So I remember it was the weekend and I was like, man, I, I live in Hawaii and it's the weekend. I should be stoked. I was like, man, like, I know, I know I can break this. And I was like, what can I do? So when I kind of got the zip fix, the zip, the zip trick uh, working, I was, I was ecstatic. So, yeah. So. You know, I guess we have our moments every now <laughs> so, and Any other questions? Yeah, Jaron. So the, the Microsoft bug that you submitted, the, the one that automatically ran the macro, that was already tested. Correct. So that was patched uh, eventually. So by the so what the backstory on that is the original researchers found that this would work on Office 2011. And so Microsoft said, not fix, that's way too old. Uh, the problem was what CERT found is if the user had selected disable macros as the top security settings, which I think is the best security settings to fix, that if that setting was enabled, those macros would still automatically execute. So CERT kind of found that and pushed out an alert before Microsoft had had a fix. So that was a zero day vulnerability for a, a few months. But yes, Microsoft went back and specifically addressed the automatic macro code execution. But the sandbox escape and quarantine thing, uh, I didn't point this out, but you could plug that into any attack. So if you have a buffer overflow in Word or another way to execute macros, or if you're just using traditional me methods that the attacker would, the user would still have to click allow, you could kind of couple those components and have this now uh, generic sandbox escape and bypass of Apple's quarantine mechanisms. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a nice kind of component. You can swap in different pieces of, of this to build other exploit chains. Yes? I'm very curious what the Apple fix was. Me too. Uh, there's some Apple attendees here. They probably will be able to share some more information. Uh, if I had to guess, and I might be totally wrong, uh, they probably prevented uh, the creation of login items uh, because in theory, you sh if you're sandbox, you shouldn't be able to create a login item. Um, so that to me was very surprising that I could do that. Um, that was really kind of the second step after executing the macros. So I think that was the first thing that they did. I'm not sure if they addressed the quarantine and notarization issue, because again, like I mentioned to Jaren's question, in theory, you could take that piece and use that in another attack. So say you have a browser bug or some other exploit that gives you arbitrary code execution on Mac OS. If you want to persist something uh, in a manner, if you do a straight persistence, quarantine is probably going to kick your butt with notarization, unless you use one of the tricks that maybe Vladimir talked about yesterday. Uh, but in this case, you create a login, uh, sorry, a launch agent using something like Bash. Uh, and then I don't believe Bash sets the quarantine attribute, so notarization checks don't even apply. Or if Bash does, you can remove them directly before running that. Uh, I believe Apple probably is going to do something about that. I imagine moving forward in, in 10.16, they're probably going to say everything has to be notarized. Um, that's obviously the path they're going down. Um, so for now, it's kind of dependent on the quarantine attribute. So if that's not there, notarization checks aren't uh, enforced. Yes. Uh, no, ask away. I love it. So for, for uh, the library zip extraction, is that something that's always happened? Because I'm not familiar with that behavior. It was just in libraries, which is expected on startup or on login. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was like. <laughs> you. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, if you persist. But the thing is, there's other file formats that you could probably persist. So it's kind of interesting that Apple allows you to persist non apps. Um, again, it's probably a usability thing, but I can't really think of a usability case where you're like, I want to persist um, that. So it's, it's kind of an interesting, surprising trick. Uh, is there a question over here? Yes. Yeah, so you, uh, you mentioned you need to do some research on XLM, and it's pretty old. Yeah. Have you found anything with like uh, hosting the OLE support or anything with the XLM and the other ones? Yeah, so the question was kind of looking into these other Microsoft file formats. You know, I really like to just focus on Mac OS stuff. Uh, so I really didn't dig too much into these Microsoft specific uh, languages and support. Uh, the researchers that found the, the original bug that originally they only recognized affecting uh, Office 2011, they gave some really good talks. And um, I think if I hop to here, I've cited some of their uh, blog posts. For example, like the abusing the SYLK file format, they really go into all the details of that. Uh, but I don't know if they've mentioned uh, OLE or some of the other specific file types. So maybe something good to look into, uh, kind of outside my area of expertise. Uh, but again, it'd be interesting to see if there's other avenues that you could kick off this same exploit chain uh, as well. Uh, 
Part of the figure is, you know, you said Mike and Gage, so I was wondering how many papers you you had to go back to that. Yeah, no, they were the one, like, when I read about this bug, I was like, what the hell? I was like, it's XML? No, XLM. It's like uh, Excel for, you know, macro language. And, and this file format, again, it's back from the 1980s. So, uh, you know, one thing that's great about Microsoft is they support these legacy uh, file formats and applications that were just written eons before security was even on everyone's mind. Uh, Apple does a little better job, right? They have no problem saying our way or the highway. And a lot of times that is to kick out legacy stuff, which from a security point of view makes uh, a lot of sense. So users complain and moan. Kernel extensions is a great example, but purely from a security point of view, that's actually a really good idea. Awesome. All right, we have prizes to give away. So. <laughs> give me one second. All right, so you're all at the Objective by the Sea conference, in case that was not obvious. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just going to wrap this up. I have a few final to do's uh, before we go on our merry way. Uh, so, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, this conference is made possible by you know, a, a few supporters. Uh, first and foremost, all the Patreon supporters of Objective C, yourself included. Uh, your financial support goes to creating this amazing conference, also the free open source security tools on Objective by the Sea blogs. Uh, and you know, I get a lot of really cool emails from people around the world who, uh, you know, thank me personally for a lot of the work I do, but I always like to say, hey, it's kind of this more community effort. So really it couldn't be done without all of you. So round of applause to you. Also, I want to thank Josh Kozik Ninja for that awesome quote of like, I'm going to print that out and <laughs> put it above my bed. All right. I also want to thank the sponsors of the conference. Uh, you know, we have a lot of really great sponsors who also financially contribute to running a conference. Uh, but more so, a lot of these companies are very passionate about Mac security and, uh, you know, publish a lot of great research. Uh, you know, for example, uh, we had some speakers from the various uh, sponsors who talked about some really cool research they're doing, really pushing the envelope, working with Apple to create and improve uh, security of Mac OS users uh, around the world. So let's give them a round of applause there. <laughs> also, speaker sponsors, uh, you know, Hawaii is kind of far away from well, oh, pretty much everything. Um, <laughs> I know it's a great place to come visit, but I just want to acknowledge these companies for, uh, you know, letting their speakers come out, talk about the research they do, covering lodging and travel costs. Uh, definitely not something I take for granted. So one more round of applause for our incredible speaker sponsors. <laughs> cool. So we also have some exciting news. You mentioned at the beginning that T-shirt sales, 100% of the sales go to a local charity. Again, the charity we chose is Mua, who works with uh, families uh, here on the island of Maui, uh, families who have children with develop developmental needs. Uh, we sold uh, between 50 and 60 T-shirts, which means we raised $1,500. Uh, the conference matches that 100%. So we actually raised over $3,000, which is the most we have ever raised at an Objective by the Sea conference. So this is all thanks to you. <laughs> Thank you. 
few other people to thank. Uh, our speakers, you know, people always come and say, Patrick, thanks for organizing this conference. And I'm always like, well, this conference wouldn't be happening without one, the attendees, and, you know, two, our speakers. Uh, so again, thank you for all the speakers. As a speaker, I know the amount of time and effort it takes, um, you know, doing a lot of research, the emotional roller coaster, uh, creating your slides. And, you know, believe it or not, I even still get nervous coming up here and, and talking. So, uh, you know, I know public speaking for a lot of speakers, especially in our field, is you know, something that we would rather not be doing. So uh, I just want to really recognize and thank the speakers who uh, are willing to come up and share their research, uh, even if it's in Hawaii. So let's give them a round of applause, too. So uh, we will be posting all the slides from the conference on the Objective by the Sea website. Uh, so if you want PDFs of those, the photos from the conference uh, that Brian has been taking. Brian shoots our conference every year. It's Hawaii. It's great. He's uh, kind of one of the photographers that gets nerds. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he kind of a nerd himself, I would say, in a good way. So uh, he's taking a lot of cool pictures. So we'll put those up on uh, Flickr as, as soon as we get them. Another thanks, I want to thank the conference crew. Uh, oftentimes I get a lot of the kudos for organizing a great conference in Hawaii, and it's great, but really, like, behind the scenes, they're doing all the hard work. So first and foremost, Andy, who is the queen of the Objective-C conference, and actually this conference was her idea. So in a way, we should all give her a round of applause because if it wasn't for her, none of us would be here. <laughs> She's going to kill me. More of that. Uh, I also want to thank Andrew, Christina, Jaren. Uh, Andrew and uh, Christina have a 22 month old son. Is that right? Uh, you know, left them for a way to come and help out with the conference. They've been here for a few days helping. Uh, they've been at all the Objective by the Sea conferences. Uh, Jaren supporting as well. So, again, it's incredible for me as a conference organizer to know that things will run smoothly because of their support. So, round of applause to you guys as well. <laughs> All right, so at the beginning, we mentioned that we were going to give away some AirPods to the social influencer. That was the person who was the most prolific Twitter supporter on social media of the conference. So, Matt, are you still around? Yes. Woo! Yeah. I want to. <laughs> Uh, he tweeted almost all the talks, uh, content, shout outs. That's incredibly helpful uh, as, a, as a conference, you know, we can not touch. <laughs> <laughs> Matt also runs a conference in Vancouver. So if you're interested in Mac admin type stuff, Mac security stuff, definitely check out his conference. Uh, he's a great friend, organizes an amazing conference, and Vancouver is a really cool place to visit. So, thank you, Patrick. I want to hug you, buddy. We'll hug in, you know, yeah. two weeks. <laughs> we also mentioned that the <laughs> the best uh, conference theme picture would win a T-shirt. Uh, you know, try not to talk or joke about the coronavirus too much because, you know, in all seriousness, it's a worldwide pandemic. However, I love this picture because, you know, we're out here uh, learning about Mac security. Uh, so this was a very creative picture name uh, that was taken by Jan and was posted on social media. So Jan, if you're here, uh, perfect. We have some t-shirts for you. Um, where did you find the mask? Did, like, I thought those were like a really short supply. Yeah, I got the mask before coming. Up. Okay, that's the smart so, thing. So, <laughs> awesome. Um, so, we have a few different sizes. So, you know, what are the, I'll choose my money. If you want one for a friend or a tour, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And thank you for purchasing one of the models for any uh, That's a great picture. So, yeah, we can pull it up. Pull it up. Hold up. Awesome. Very creative. Thanks again. You made me laugh. <laughs> All right. Uh, before we do the last raffle, of course, Objective by the Sea is going to continue. Uh, 
you know, this was a rather challenging year given worldwide events, but you know, we're going to move past that and uh, be back for four, version 4.0. Uh, our goal is to go back to Europe. Uh, we try to do one in Hawaii uh, and then somewhere international. Uh, end of you know, Q4 2020, tentatively. Uh, again, we'll have the best Mac security researchers and iOS hackers and researchers talking. And again, we will probably keep the conference around 1,000, not 1,000, 100 attendees. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, I couldn't handle that. Um, and so I would like to personally invite you to that. Uh, of course, we'll tweet about this and post about this. Um, but you know, I, I love organizing this conference and hanging out with you all, so I would be super stoked if I see you back. We're gonna do a group photo uh, right after this. I really need to order these slides better. Okay, before we say aloha and do the group photos, we have a raffle for some interesting uh, items. So the first raffle we wanna do is, there are some people here in the audience who have been to every single Objective by the Sea conference. So if you have been to every single conference, raise your hand, all three. Awesome. All right, so what we're gonna do is we are going to do a raffle and whose ever number is closest to the randomly generated number, which is going to be actively randomly generated, will either win a latest generation Apple Watch or a Nintendo Switch. So, sweet, right? We are going to hop into Google, which has a random number generator. I'm going to click Generate. And then it's up to you to, you know, if you're close to this, yell it out, and we'll try to figure it out. I was thinking there's a better way, but, you know, I'm lazy, so. All right, 44. Who has a number that's close to 44? For, who's been, sorry, who's been to every Objective by the Sea conference? We'll do, we'll do the next raffle for, for everyone. 29. 29, okay, who's good at math? <laughs> okay, so 29. Huh, sure, yeah. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do a redo then. All right, Google says 95. This one should be easier. So it goes up to 100. 59. <laughs> okay, who has, a high, who has been to every conference who has a high-ish number? <laughs> Josh, what's yours? 78. 78. Mike? It's one with my little <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Yeah, about well, 80 something is closer to this. All right, Mike, get up here. <laughs> so, this is randomly selected, so you can accept it. Uh, either a Nintendo Switch or the latest generation Apple Watch. Probably open the Switch. Awesome. <laughs> Wait, we gotta, we gotta pause because this, this is a good one. Why is this open? Uh, we'll give a talk next time on implanting a... <laughs> Thanks, dude. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Again, we want to just thank those who attend our conferences many years in a row. Stoked. Awesome. Uh, so now we're going to do a general raffle. This is open to everybody. Uh, again, we're going to use you, Google's random number generator. I hope nobody's man in, man in the middling this. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be an exact match, so we'll do this until someone has this. Tracy? Awesome. Woo! Unopened. <laughs> <laughs> Latest generation of Apple Watch. You have an Apple Watch already? Right? I mean, all of them. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this that is this a video? Oh, maybe it is. So when we were in Majorca, maybe looking for potential places, we brought a drone and did a drone shot. I think we should maybe do conference there sometime. It's 
beautiful. Anyways, uh, aloha, which means hello, uh, I love you, and also <laughs> goodbye. In this context, it's it's the latter two. Um, thank you again for making the trek out here. Uh, you know, I know it's kind of difficult travel conditions given everything that's going on, uh, but I'm stoked that we were able to pull this off together. So thanks again. One more round of applause. See you all on Jeff for C4. So now we're gonna do a group photo, maybe down by the lobby? Outside would be good. Yeah, can we do that? Yeah, you wanna bring it right there. Okay, so there's a, a an aloha sign. Or do it here with the background. Can we do both? Yeah. Okay, outside, the queen has spoken. <laughs> so to get to the Aloha sign, basically just walk out, you go past the lobby, and then it's kind of where a lot of you ate lunch, uh, kind of past that. So follow the Objective C-shirts, um, but grab all your stuff.